this video we'll be looking at the last part of the nuclear energy topic, nuclear fusion. Now fusion is very much the opposite process to what we looked at in the last video on nuclear fission. So where fission was a large nucleus splitting into smaller ones to release energy, this is a case of two very very small nuclei joining together to release energy instead. Now when we do this we are combining the two nuclei and resulting in only a couple of very simple products. So we'll have the majority of the mass combined and a neutron or so given off as well as a large amount of energy. Now the most common version for this that is intended for use in nuclear energy is the use of the hydrogen isotopes deuterium and tritium, which join to form helium and a single neutron, neither of which are harmful, both of which are very easy to maintain and manage, and the energy released can easily be transferred to water as normal. Now we have achieved nuclear fusion quite a significant number of times, the majority of which were through nuclear weapons. So atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs were all fusion based. The initial ones were fission, the more developed versions later on were fusion based and far more destructive. Now the issue with maintaining a fusion reaction that isn't just dissipated instantaneously is the temperature. Now the temperature required to sustain fusion is in the realm of 100 million degrees Celsius. That is not something that is easy to sustain on Earth. Now no known material can hold something at that temperature. Can remain in contact with it without being disintegrated. The plasma that we're using, because it has to be hotter than gas, so it has to separate the electrons from the nuclei to form a plasma, that can be suspended through use of electromagnetic fields. So if we use extremely powerful electromagnets, it is possible to cause a floating stream of plasma where this reaction is occurring at 100 million degrees or so. Which is quite a difficult engineering feat if you can imagine it. And this diagram here of a tokamak reactor is demonstrating where this would occur. You can see the donut shape of it means that the plasma would be floating within, not in contact with any surface. Now you can see better imagery here where the tokamak reactor example is shown in this model on the left as the floating red cylinder traveling all the way around. And you can see those metal rings around producing this magnetic field to keep it levitating and keep it accelerating, which maintains the energy, maintaining the temperature. And you'd also have a way of absorbing energy into water supply around it. It is also difficult because the electromagnets need to be super cooled. So in order to produce this toroid donut shaped magnetic field, you need super cooled electromagnets on the outside, whilst the plasma inside is 100 million degrees plus. So you can see an image of a very small amount of plasma being tested, but we still haven't done it in a large scale. Now this is all based on our knowledge from the natural occurrence of fusion, which is in the stars. Now we obviously can't go to a star to investigate this close up, the temperature's far too insane for anything like that, but we do know the process, we can observe it quite well. And what we know is that stars when they're formed are largely hydrogen, and as the hydrogen's compressed, you increase the temperature which allows fusion to occur at the core of the star. Now the thermal energy released during this fusion process allows the star to maintain a stable structure. So the gravitational field pulling in 
is opposed by the energy released, as we know from when we covered binding energy, there is a large output of energy. So this sustains the star in its main sequence for the longest time. That's the longest part of a star's life cycle. And you can see here where we illustrate it. It's in the core itself where the most pressure is experienced. So you do end up with some hydrogen and helium floating on the outside, which is not going to really get involved. It's the core that matters the most for fusion occurrence. Now we can see that here as well. We do say that when all of the hydrogen has been used up, but in reality it's all the accessible hydrogen, so all the stuff that's near the core. You do end up with an outer layer, an atmosphere of sorts, which is the leftover bits that aren't hot enough, aren't close enough to cause further fusion. Now hydrogen plus hydrogen gives us helium, and we continue to get a process here that as the accessible fusion material runs out, you get further compression, higher temperatures reached, more fusion occurring of higher elements. And this can keep happening until you reach iron. And we've said before that iron is the very stable state. It's not beneficial energetically to fuse beyond it. So the star will reach its limit at that point, and that's only the most massive stars. Many don't get anywhere near that level. They'll stop much, much sooner in the fusion process. But we sort of get this onion structure. As it's plasma, it's not going to be fixed in these layers, but that gives you an idea of the percentages of each element present. Now, when a very small star collapses, it won't have reached this. It will just have hydrogen and helium, try to get to lithium, and then just collapse and form a dwarf star. But very large stars continue to make these layers and layers of different material during the super red giant phase. Once they've reached iron, or whatever their limit is, they will explode as a supernova. Now being an explosion, it is hotter than the state of the star as a red supergiant. So this dramatic increase in temperature allows us a very unique situation where higher levels of fusion can be occurred. Even though they're not energetically beneficial, we're not looking for stability. This is a resulting explosion. So every rare element above iron is formed in this way. And that's the only way that they are formed in nature. So anything above iron on the periodic table only occurs in nature through the death of a giant star. Now, the core of the supernova is, is the more dense materials, and that can collapse and form a neutron star or black hole, both of which will be covered in more detail in the astrophysics topic. But most of the material is thrown outwards and will coalesce, draw itself together due to gravity, forming new stars and new planetary systems. So these nebulae are the rebirth of the stars, but it's always going to be smaller than the one that first exploded. And that means gradually we're going to shift towards the smaller star scale and away from iron being produced. So heavier elements will be less and less prominent, and we will end up with a cold and dark universe. Thank you for your time.